Hey world, Dan Brown here with another episode of EDH Rec Tech, the Magic the Gathering deck building show focused on the variant known as Elder Dragon Highlander, wherein I use the popular online deck building resource EDH Rec to uh, share my <coughs> opinions as to what the masses seem to be doing well and what the masses maybe could be doing better when it comes to uh, building out the 99 for any given commander's commander deck, right? Today we'll be looking at Hope of Girapur. Uh, go ahead and show you what that does. Uh, real quick though, uh, a refresher on how EDH Rec works. It has thousands of crowdsourced deck lists and uses that information to uh, suss out, spit out some data for people who are building out individual commander decks. It tells you what sort of cards people are running when a certain card is the commander. Uh, so that if you're building out a deck for the first time or trying to make tweaks to a deck you already have, uh, yeah, it just throws some ideas at you. And uh, there's one section in particular called signature cards. Those are cards that are disproportionately prevalent when a given card is the commander as compared to other decks of the same color identity. Uh, I'm going to look at those and tell you my opinions on those. That's how I basically help you help yourself to either be uh, guided by the masses or avoid being led astray by the masses, okay? And the, the color identity here is n nothing, not a zip zilch, it's colorless. Hope of Gear Per wanted to give myself a, a bit of a deck building challenge. Build out a colorless deck. How are we going to do that? How are we going to build a deck where no card costs more than $15 that's not trying to like combo out just trying to play a kind of straight ahead maybe you'd call it a 75% strategy uh, where everyone has a good fun time without betraying good deck building principles uh, hope the most important part about it is it's a 1-1 one, one flyer for one so you're always going to cast it on turn one or almost always uh, and the other ability it could be could be quite relevant you know, every deck I build out for EDH Rec Tech, most of them anyway, I don't really own in paper, so I haven't really piloted them in multiplayer pods that often. I, I assume this ability could become pretty good mid-game, late-game if one opponent who uh, is relying heavily on non-creature spells, uh, if you're able to, I don't know, chain a few of those in a row, that can really be, uh, that can really hamstring a hamstring a planeswalker, if you know what I'm saying. But, you know, more, more than anything, it's a 1-1 one, one flying for one that we're going to try to make a little bit bigger than 1-1. One, one. Let's take a look at the signature cards. Wow, there they are. Impressive. There's so, so many of them. Let's, let's look at them one at a time. Dowsing Dagger. Very, it's, it's one of these, what do you call it? Ixalan, that's where we are. Ixalan cards that transforms into a land. Unique card design makes it a little bit trickier to evaluate. You just have to stop and think about it for a second longer. What are you really getting for the mana and tempo you're pouring into it? So so what, what, what you're doing is you're paying two mana to cast a Dowsing Dagger, then two mana again to equip it, presumably to hope, presumably that you cast earlier, uh, and then you have to swing in and hit someone, and then it turns into a Gilded Lotus in a deck that doesn't really need color mana. You know, mana of a given color, it, you just need any mana. So a little bit of um, wasted motion there just on the Lost Veil. It, it, you know, it'd be better if it cost one less to equip or something and only generated colorless for our purposes. But uh, yeah, just a glorified Thran Dynamo. Uh, and, and the Dowsing Dagger, I mean, you're, you're spending two mana to cast and two mana to equip and you have to be able to get through, which you usually can, but it's not a guarantee. Uh, I don't know. I just think that you'd be better suited running another two or three mana mana rock in place of this. Uh, I, I, I mean, I could see an argument for it. I can see someone running it to some success in a hope deck. But I can't say that I recommend it. I, I can't give it the EDH Rec Tech stamp of approval. Hammer of Nazan, on the other hand, uh, I, I am running this in my hope deck uh, because hope lends itself pretty obviously to a Voltron strategy. We're trying to make our 1-1 one, one flyer a little bit bigger, a little scarier, and a little bit safer. The stat boost on the hammer here isn't that huge, but uh, granting indestructible is being able to get around a healthy handful of board wipes, um, and also enabling us to save valuable tempo by immediately equipping any equipment that we drop to Hope once this is in play. Yeah, that, that can be relevant, definitely be relevant. Um, I, I do want to re-emphasize though that the stat boost is not huge on Hammer of Nazan. In, in a colorless deck, you know, I, I am going to be running so much ramp 
just because that's one thing colorless does really well you have to stick to what a color is good at and you might as well go kind of all in in that direction so m more important to me than the number four in the upper right hand corner here of, uh, that is to say the converted mana cost of hammer of nizan more important to me there is the number one which is to say that there this is one card okay when i'm comparing the stat boost to what i'm paying for that stat boost. I don't care so much about the mana cost. The mana cost is somewhat arbitrary once we get to a mid game because we're going to have so many mana rocks. I just want that one card to give my hope as big of a boost as possible. So if this did not grant indestructible and the sort of flash equip, you know, dirt to dirt, I uh, wouldn't run it. But the, the indestructible and the uh, ability to equip super quick is uh, just too good to too good to overlook. Um, but Bloodforged Battle Axe, on the other hand, just kidding, still super good. You're paying one mana for one card, but this one card can turn into all sorts of, I guess they're not cards, they'd be tokens, but uh, still, like the stat boost you're getting for one card, let alone at one mana. I mean, two to equip, so three mana, If I mean, depends on how you're counting. But yeah, this could potentially make hope enormously huge. It's worth pointing out, it's worth making sure that you realize that each copy of Bloodforged Battle Axe then creates a copy of itself upon damage. So it's it's actually exponentially scary. I guess you do have to pay mana to equip each of them, but like I said earlier, we're going to have arbitrary amounts of mana by the time we're in the mid game because Colorless just has there's so many mana rocks in Colorless. Okay, Ghostfire Blade. I, I don't like it for exactly what I've been spelling out card after card after card here. I don't care that this only costs one mana. I don't care that it only costs one to equip. What I care about is how big a boost it's giving for how many cards it is. So for one card, one deck slot, we're only getting a plus two, plus two boost. Uh, that's not enough. I want my hope to at least be plus four, plus four scarier. Maybe plus five, plus five scarier. Like get up into three shot, two shot, maybe one shot kills. Probably not one shot kills in this deck, but two shot kills are definitely possible. I guess a one shot kill would be possible. Yeah, you know, the more I think about it, the more I think that's possible. But not if you're jamming cards like Ghost Fire Blade. Okay, don't like it. Hero's Blade, sa same thing, really. It's not. It's a slightly bigger stat boost. The difference between 3 power and 2 power is actually pretty huge. Um, but, yeah, I st it's the same reason. I don't like it. You can, you can do better. I'd rather pay a lot of mana for an equipment that gives a lot of a stat boost. And this doesn't quite do it for me. Loxodon Warhammer, on the other hand... Um, Lifelink, if you watched my Ural deck tech for Ural, the Mist Stalker, uh, you'll recall that I, I, I pointed out that Lifelink in a Voltron deck is pseudo, pseudo, pseudo card advantage. Because if you expect to gain 10, 20, 30 life off of a creature having Lifelink, then you know, you'll probably survive an extra turn. That is to say, you'll survive to see an extra draw step. And in that kind of loose definition of card advantage, of replacing itself, locks it on Warhammer, uh, it gets there. Lifelink is just super good. And the plus three, plus oh, you know, without Lifelink, not quite enough of a boost, but Lifelink just is super duper. Super duper. Pooper scooper. Fire Shrieker. Uh, could be super good. Um, I am not running it because I'm playing, even though Voltron is my win condition, it's not the only thing the deck is doing. I'm trying to play a kind of well-rounded strategy, so I don't have a huge number of equipments. I believe I have like uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 10, but it's not beyond the realm of possibility that there would not be another equipment in my hand or on the battlefield when I have a Fire Shrieker, which, um, makes it not very good. If you're giving a 1-1 one, one double strike, congratulations, you basically spent five mana to give it plus one, plus one. And first strike. I mean, I guess. So, uh, yeah, when you're considering whether or not to add a card, you should always consider what the worst case scenario is. And in this circumstance, a little bit too often for my liking, that worst case scenario would be, uh, I have a fire shrieker and no other equipment with a 1-1 one, one flyer. Uh, not so good. If you ran more equipment, it could be good. But in my build, not so good. Foundry Inspector, uh, yeah, this is just really good. Um, I had to, I, I had to catch myself. I didn't put it in my initial build, but then as I was just doing prep for what I'm doing right now, that is my commentary on these cards, I came across this one. I was like, what am I going to say for this? 
how am I gonna how am I gonna shoot this card down? And I got thinking about it. I was like, I can't. It's good. I should be running it. So I put it in. I I took out a different um, mana dork. It, it was it was a Milliken actually. I was running Milliken, but then I was just like, Foundry Inspector is just better, you know, because you can get the value of you know one mana off, same as like a one mana mana rock, um, but you can get it multiple times per turn if you're casting lots and lots of artifacts. So you know this could be as good as a Thran Dynamo or better. The only drawback being that it's a little more vulnerable because it has legs. It is on a creature. But uh, yeah, no, it's just good. It's really good. There's no way to deny how good it is as hard as I might have wanted to. Lodestone Golem. I, I am not running this and I wouldn't recommend running it unless you are going pretty heavily in a, a more stacks sort of direction. If you're trying to make it hard for your opponents to play spells, trying to tax them more than just this. But but this by itself in a deck, uh, I, I don't like very much just because, I mean, in my deck, it would just be pulling it in kind of a different weird direction. And, and one problem with a lot of EDH decks is people try to jam in too many ideas. Like pick one idea and run with it. Go super linear in that direction. Don't put one somewhat weak stacks effect in a Voltron deck. Okay, I, I, I can't really see an argument for running this in my hope deck. A different colorless stacks deck, I suppose. But, you know, why, why, you, why you gotta play stacks? You know, I'm, you know what, it's okay to have one stacks deck as long as you bring other decks to switch to if the first game you played with it was oppressive and unfun. Uh, or led to salty tears of your opponents. Uh, it might be merited, might be a little bit merited. Uh, Argentum Armor? This is exactly the sort of equipment that I like to see. Colorless is hard pressed for removal, and this is, I mean, a weird, like, it, it's not instant speed. Like, it, it's, it warns your opponents that it's coming, and you have to spend 12 mana before you even get it online, and that's all contingent on you having a creature. But if it gets online, if you get a couple swings off, like, that's some pretty good <laughs> removal. Not to mention that the plus six plus six is exactly the kind of boost that I'm looking for. That immediately brings hope up to three shot territory, three swings, and that's 21 commander damage. Um, yeah, yeah. We don't care so much about the six mana to cast and six mana to equip. What we care about is that this is one card and only takes up one deck slot. And for that one deck slot, we are getting a huge boost on our otherwise rinky-dinky flying machine. Uh, yes, yes, I love this. Run this in your Hope of Gear Per Decks. Uh, Sword of the Animist would be filed under ramp more so than equipment. Even though it is technically an equipment, I would put this in the ramp category. I am running it in my Hope deck, but not because it provides any sort of a relevant stat boost, just because, again, it's better than Milliken. <laughs> it's better than Mannequin. Uh, I, I cut some... I think I cut Sisse's ring actually for this because most of the time drawing this for the same amount of mana over the course of a couple turns, I would get more value out of this than a slow ring, a, a four mana soul ring. Um, Junk Diver is, uh, I mean, I'm not running it. I can see the idea here though, uh, in a deck that's already kind of built around a flying artifact creature with lots of equipment. This is just kind of like a backup commander in a way, a backup dinky artifact flyer that you can quickly make scary by slapping some equipment on that gets you some kind of value when it dies. I am not running it because again, considering the worst case scenario, the worst case scenario would be, I don't know, you don't have very many good targets in your graveyard when this dies a little bit sooner than you're ready for it to. Um, I mean, yeah, I, I can see an argument for running it. It's probably not a bad include. I have not included it. It's just kind of a bubble card. You know, it's close, but not quite where... I mean, I don't know. I could, I, I could be convinced that this is a good card to run in the comments below. Leave a comment, let me know why. Masterwork of Ingenuity. Uh, I, I am not running it. Obviously, it could be bonkers. It could be another... What, Shield of Calder? Is that what that was? Or, no, Argentum Armor. What am I talking about? I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. That's a... Uh, there's no of Calder cards that you're about to see soon in my deck. I don't know why that was on the brain. Masterwork of Ingenuity. Again, thinking about what the worst case scenario for this card is, though. In a deck, like, I am not running a ton of equipments. Like, I'm, you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of 10, maybe a little under. 
but there would be many situations I feel like where I would draw this and just not have another equipment like not the majority of times but enough times to make it worth cutting for just a more mid-rangey good stuff equipment you know that, that provides some value on its own without needing another equipment in play so same reason as the fire shrieker uh, sometimes this is just a dead card especially like post artifact board wipe if I'm stuck with like four cards in hand and none of them are that relevant and just desperately trying to build a board if I top deck this I'm gonna be really frustrated uh, and I just want to avoid that situation sword of vengeance another bubble card I'm not running it but one could very easily uh, make an argument for it. I don't have a whole lot of haste enablers and that might actually be a good thing to try to jam in there. Maybe on my next pass I could see fit to put one of these in but the reason I'm not is again because it is one card that only provides plus two plus so as a stat boost and I just uh, mana is not as relevant when I'm running as many mana rocks as I am in this Hope of Gira per deck uh, so I just I want I want a little bit more the keyword, I, I mean, I don't care that much about these keywords. Maybe I do. I don't know. Maybe the v Vigilance is good. Maybe I should run this. Uh, yeah, may maybe you should convince me about this one, too, in the comments below. May maybe. Maybe. I don't know. Maybe. Could be. There they are again. Signature cards. Look at that. Let's get to this deck tech. What do you say? EDH, Rec Tech, Deck Tech, Hope of Gear Per, or as I am calling this deck, um, Obama Copter. It's mid-range good stuff that ramps like crazy just to do normal things. It ramps and ramps and ramps and ramps just to do normal things because it is colorless and the way Wizards of the Coast has designed this game is that colorless has to pay end game mana costs for mid game effects. This is what we're doing uh, and we don't have a problem doing it. It's just the way we have to do it. It has a very well rounded play style, well rounded gameplay. You rarely are the arch enemy. People are rarely like shaking in their boots about what you have going on in your Hope of Gear per deck. But you're also rarely out of the running. You're rarely in last place. You know, you're rarely caught with your pants down. Uh, you're able to interact. You're able to, you know, pressure opponents. Um, it, it, it milks extra value here, where maybe it gets an edge, where maybe it makes up for the fact that colorless has to pay end game mana costs for mid game effects is that we are able to run a whole bunch of non-basic lands we don't care about mana fixing we don't run any colors so we can run all sorts of really really cool colorless non-basic lands with some sort of an upside and oh boy we sure do we'll get to those shortly here let's look at the fundamentals though ramp we have an extreme amount of ramp we have 27 ramp effects that is what colorless does best so we're going hyperlinear in that direction um, draw we have an average maybe a little bit below average uh, number of draw effects although they can be relatively potent colorless draws pretty well which means that really all colors have access to good draw options you should never you, you never have an excuse for not running some amount of draw in a deck because even colorless can do it. Okay, we've got we've got an average amount, 12 times. Our hand uh, will rarely be empty. Very rarely will we have an empty hand. Control, we have a below average amount. That might be understandable in colorless. I mean, colorless does have a decent control suite. That you just yeah, everything for some reason is is seven mana to do. I don't know. It takes us seven mana to do what spells with colors uh, can do for three. So. Again, that's us ramping, ramping, ramping like crazy just to do normal things. But you can do normal things. It is possible. We just need that extreme amount of ramp to open the door. So here's the game plan. We're going to play Hope. Ramp, ramp, ramp. We're going to pressure opponents with equipment. We're going to draw some cards. We're going to remove some threats. We're going to get some non-basic value from that land suite I was talking about. We're going to appear to be in second, okay? All right, we're just going to sit back. We're going to gang up with our opponents, play some politics, knock out the arch enemy positioning ourselves to be the strongest remaining player, defeating the remaining players with well-rounded gameplay. That's the strategy. Hey, hey, I have another strategy for you. How about you build this deck or another deck of mine or any, really any deck. Any deck you find on the internet, you should you should buy it. Spend spend your money on Magic the Gathering. I doubt that's something I have to tell you twice to do. I want to be an enabler here. I want to enable your 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 game gaming that's the whole point uh flipside gaming is a local gaming store in upstate new york they're trying to build out their online presence dan brown is a human being in pittsburgh pennsylvania who's also trying to build out his magic the gathering related online presence and you can help incentivize me 
to do more things like this by buying magic cards or any you can buy anything through them i mean a game that they have in stock i, I don't mean it they're not amazon uh, and if you use the promo code pogo i'll get a cut of it it's very helpful money helps me buy food which helps me survive which helps me make these consider doing that also if you want to support um just future pogo bat gaming content i want you to send me your bottom up deck building ideas edh rec tech is naturally going to uh, sort of focus on top-down deck strategies. That is, we start with a commander and build down from there, right? And that lends itself to kind of generic good stuff strategies. That's kind of what you're seeing with Hope. I'm just trying to help you build decks that can win average EDH pods with a given commander. Um, but that's not the only way to build a deck, right? You can start with cool card synergies or just a cool idea as to what you're trying to do. And uh, then go from there and then pick a commander later after you found like the ideal support cards to begin with. So what I want is for you to email me card synergies or cool deck ideas that aren't about a specific commander to danbrownuniverse at gmail.com. And then you know, towards the end of the year this year, quarter four, 2018, Dan Brown through Pogobat Gaming is going to uh, make more content. This more bottom up. All right. So anyway, let's, uh, you wanna, let's check out this Hope deck I've put together, eh? As usual, we're starting with the lands here. Um, not as usual, these lands are very interesting. It's the most exciting thing, in my opinion, about playing a colorless deck. Uh, the fact that you don't have to dedicate any land slots to color fixing, and therefore you can jam a bunch of value non-basics, right? Uh, like I said, you know, in colorless, you have to pay lots of mana just to do normal things. This is how we start to claw our way back to parity. P-A-R-I-T-Y uh, in terms of like value generation. So um, Arcane Lighthouse, creatures lose Hexproof and Shroud, and you're able to target them. Um, you know, do a little one-two punch with an opponent here often because we don't have a fantastic ramp suite, although, you know, we can use this for our own also. Um, just, yeah, good to have. Arch of Orazka, like this a lot because it is card draw. Okay, we are very frequently going to have 10 permanents. I mean, it's, it's a problem hitting that sometimes in, like, limited or in standard. But, you know, by the time we're in a mid-game, especially a deck that runs as many mana rocks as this one does, we're going to have Ascend. We're going to be able to draw cards. It's at instant speed. We can hold up mana and then wait until the end step before our turn. Um, just a good way to grind out card advantage. That's the name of the game. Blasted Landscape enters untapped and also cycles if we have plenty of lands. Blink Moth Well, uh, yeah, good to, you know, I don't know, untap our Basalt Monolith, among other options. Buried Ruin, um, we can return an artifact to our hand after it has died or run to the graveyard for some reason. Uh, very good in a colorless deck that runs lots of artifacts. Go figure. Dust Bowl, never hurts to be able to destroy a Cabal Coffers, or an Urborg, or, I don't know, any good land. A Gaia's Cradle. Goodness, there's so many good lands. Great to be able to destroy them. Encroaching Wastes, same, same thing, really. I mean, less mana efficient, and not on a stick, but still good. Field of Ruin, yeah, destroying lands. Who doesn't like destroying lands? Mystifying Maze, a slightly less good maze of if... Uh, it would be good if you could target your own creatures because then you'd get an extra ETB out of them, but uh, I digress. Mikokoro, we've seen this before. A little group hug effect, although uh, being able to control when the card draw happens uh, benefits us disproportionately because we can do it either during our turn or immediately before our turn. Mage Ring Network, no disadvantage. It enters untapped and taps for a colorless right away, or if we're not using it, we can just you kind of store up some storage counters until we need a big old gush of mana. Inventor's Fair, I was talking about this in my Joyra um, deck tech, um, very good, I mean, even better in a colorless deck, dare I say, because we have so many artifacts, always going to be able to gain the life, uh, always going to be able to search for an artifact card, put it into play, very, very strong. Ghost Quarter, again, who doesn't love destroying non-basic lands? Gaia Reach Sanitarium. Sort of like a Mikokoro, except they ever, everyone has to discard a card then. Uh, yeah, uh, a, a loot Mikokoro. Draw a card, discard a card. You know, if you control when that happens, it is disproportionately advantageous. In a pinch, why not turn your land into a 3-4 flying... What is it? Gar gargoyle. I almost called it a golem. It's a gargoyle. Uh, 
often opponents f overlook this card, forget that it's sitting there in play, and uh, swing into what they think is an empty board, but actually you have a gargoyle and can block and kill their 2-2 two -two that's swinging in. Foundry of the consoles uh, makes Thopters. Why not? Nephalia Academy. Um, I mean, if, if, if someone wants to make you discard cards and you want to put it on top of your library instead, might as well have this in there. It doesn't hurt to have that option. You can maybe a corner case, but on a land that enters untapped and makes the color list that we need anyway. Oh, hey, this is a good card. Rogue's Passage. Yeah, I mean, you know, our um, hope does fly, so often it will be able to go over any opponent's creatures anyway, but in case your opponent's board has, you know, other flyers, uh, always nice to be able to make it unblockable. Scavenger Grounds. Why not have a way to hose graveyard strategies? It's a land and enters untapped. You might as well have that on there too. Scorched Ruins. It, this is good. I, I've got, I mean, it, it is ramp immediately. The only drawback is that if it's only one of two lands in your opening hand, you might have to mulligan slightly more frequently. But other than that, great thing to draw into mid-game, late-game, even early game. Uh, Seagate Wreckage. Uh... You know, if, if you have no cards in hand, great way to refill. Might not happen that frequently, but when it does, you'll be glad to have it. Shrine of the Forsaken Gods. Uh, it's just a Temple of the False God. I mean, pretty much. I mean, w when you hit seven lands, and before that, taps for one. Uh, it's, a, it's a Temple of the False God without the drawback of not being, not, not doing anything before you have five lands, right? Spring Jack Pasture makes some goats. You know, get your goat. Strip mine, who doesn't love destroying lands? Tectonic edge, who doesn't love destroying lands? Thespian stage, who doesn't love making a copy of any land? Throne of the high city, it's card advantage. You know, you become the monarch and with hope of Giraper as our commander, not too hard to reclaim the monarchy, right? To, to become the monarch once again, uh, pinging people with a 1-1 flyer. Urza's Factory, why not churn out some creatures if you're not doing anything else with your abundance of mana? Vesuva, you know, I mean, why not have a copy of any land on the battlefield? And finally, Wastes, they are the last in alphabetical order. Um, they, they finally made a basic land for colorless, and uh, it's, it's good to have a handful of these. We're running seven because there are mass non-basic land destruction effects that can really hose you if you don't run any basics in your deck. Uh, so, uh, good to have these. Those are the lands. Pretty interesting land suite. Here are our ramp effects. As you can see, they are all artifacts. First up, alphabetically, Basalt Monolith. I've spoken about this card before. It's an EDH staple. It shoots you ahead three turns on the curve, although every other turn you're going to have to sacrifice tempo if you want to get that three turn advantage back again but still for the initial upfront boost of mana um, very very strong cold steel heart uh, two mana mana rock ever flowing chalice two mana mana rock or a four mana slow ring or a six mana taps for three etc etc if nothing else two mana mana rock explorer's scope like this a lot with hope as our commander, I mean, turn one, drop hope, turn two, drop scope, hope into scope, and then equip for one, and then immediately start swinging, trying to get lands onto the battlefield. Um, not to mention that our lands are often, you know, value engines in and of themselves because they're colorless, so we might as well have, you know, extra effects stapled to them. Um, very, very good. Uh, Felwar Stone, two mana mana rock, Fractured Power Stone, uh, I spoke about this in my Joyra deck tech pet card of mine, uh, because people often don't know it exists, it was printed in Plane Chase, obviously, it references the planar die, uh, two mana mana rock that enters untapped though, hard to argue with, uh, you know, if you're not in more than like, I don't know, three colors, there are even some like five color decks that I'd see fit to run this in, um, very, very good pick one up. It is a common. It's very cheap, uh, but you probably haven't opened it in any booster packs. Orozka Relic. Um, just nice to be able to draw a card off of a mana rock in a pinch. Uh, running it in this deck just because we're not hard-pressed for um, fixing. Obviously, we're a colorless deck, so the, the, the extra ability to gain some life and draw a card very relevant. Mindstone, just a staple. This should be in a lot of your decks. Magnifying Glass, you know, four mana to investigate. Mana-wise, not that efficient, but 
you know, why not grind out some extra value if you have the four mana up at the end of the turn right before you untap? Um, other than that, three mana, colorless mana rock, not too bad. Honor Worn Shaku. Uh, I like this a lot with Hope of Girapur as the commander because, you know, for three mana, it's kind of like a slow ring, right? It, you can You can tap Hope to untap this to get another mana in a pinch i mean even even if you're not in a pinch i don't know if you're trying to drop some other big threat hedron archive just a slow ring can draw you cards very good guardian idol you've probably seen this in some of my decks one of my pet cards prismatic lens i mean i don't think we're going to be filtering for colors very often uh but two mana mana rock pristine talisman you know we don't need colors, so might as well gain life off of our three mana mana rocks. Seer's Lantern, not quite as good as the uh, Magnifying Glass, but uh, Scrying One, if we have the two mana up, doesn't hurt. Soul Ring, pretty good card. Have you heard of it? Sword of the Animist, very good with Hope as our commander. Um, as early as turn, I mean, I don't, depending on how many mana rocks in our hand, as early as turn two, you could be swinging with this equipped. You're more likely turn three or four. Uh, Thought Vessel, very, very good. Worn Power Stone, slow ring for three, very good. Vessel of Endless Rest, another one of my pet cards. Just good to staple a little bit of graveyard hate to a mana rock. Urgolem's Eye, slow ring, Thran Dynamo, EDH Staple, uh, Foundry Inspector. We run so, I mean, most of our spells, I think, are artifacts, so making them cost one less. Uh, if we're casting more than one spell per turn, it's kind of like a mana rock that we're using multiple times per turn. Hedron Crawler, I mean, it, you know, it's a two-mana mana rock, kind of, uh, you know, one of my pet cards along with Mannequin here. It's the two-mana mana rock. They have legs. They will die as collateral damage, but, you know, flip side, you can use them as chump blockers. Uh, that's really the only flip side. I mean, the flip side is really, it's another two-mana mana rock. I just jam as many of those as I can. Um, Palladium Mirror, uh, slow ring with legs, and a Plague Mirror. Two-mana mana rock with legs. That's how we ramp 27 ramp effects. That is a high number. We are trying to get to a, a, a large amount of mana very quickly so that our colorless deck could do normal things because colorless costs more. Taking a look at our draw effects. First up alphabetically, we have Book of Rass. You know, again, we're paying more mana to do normal things. Costs six mana to get this into play and then two mana and two life to draw cards. Uh, but, you know, we can do that on a stick. You know, the turn after this comes into play, we know we'll have at least six mana because we spent six to cast it. So that's, you know, three cards per turn can get um, pretty ridiculous, pretty fast. The life loss don't care as much about. We're in a 40 life format, yada, yada. Bottled Cloister. Uh, it, 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 this has a unique place in a colorless EDH deck. Normally, removing your hand from the game uh, face down for all of your opponent's turns um, is a huge disadvantage. I, I hate not being able to interact during my opponent's turns because, you know, 75% of the game is not your turn in a four-player game, right? You need instant speed effects. But in, in colorless, we don't have... We have one instant, I think. We have uh, the, the seven mana exile target permanent. We'll get to that in a minute. But uh, beyond that, most of our ways of interacting are like permanents that we cast during our main phase and then can fire off at instant speed from there. So, you know, we lose a little bit of advantage in the sense that opponents see them. But you know, that enables us to run effects like bottled cloister um it, it draws us an extra card every turn uh, basically and the disadvantage is highly mitigated in a colorless deck um, dreamstone hedron you know it's a mana I, I don't include it in ramp because by the time it costs six mana you know usually you already have enough mana in the first place so i i conclude i consider this a card draw effect sacrifice for three draw three cards you know one card draw three not terrible. Uh, Lore Seeker's Stone. Um, you know, mana is generally not an issue. You saw how many mana rocks we're running. So um, three to draw three is, you know, great if your hand is empty. And then, I don't know, six mana to draw three cards is not the, the worst ratio in the world. Uh, you know, we, we, we generally 
will have the mana to do it. Um, Staff of Nin, I've spoken about this card before. You know, it's an EDH staple. Six mana is a little bit steep, but in a, a game with a power level as high as vintage when games are liable to go, you know, to turn 15 or beyond, um, draw, drawing a card every turn, you, you can get value out of this by just leaving it out there for a while. And don't overlook the one damage, pinging for one. If nothing else, you're chipping away at a life total. And often, you know, often, there are some good EDH cards with one toughness uh, that you can pick off. Or creatures with more than one toughness that just, like, blocked or were blocked and their controller forgot that the staff was around. You can finish them off. Rogue's Gloves, very good with hope as the commander. Uh, swing in each turn to draw a card. Mind's Eye, you know, again, EDH staple. We're hard-pressed for card draw in colorless, but this is a very good card draw option. Mask of Memory, same idea as Rogue's Gloves, um, you know, drawing, what's that, drawing two cards and discarding a card, that's better than uh, Rogue's Gloves, and it costs less to equip, so I, I'd say that's probably strictly better. Um, the Immortal Sun, brand new card, super juicy, it, it might creep up in price because of EDH demand, but at the time of filming this, uh, well under 15. Um, it just does all sorts of... We don't run Planeswalkers. I don't, we're not running Ugin. That's more than $15. So um, drawing an extra card, spells ca costing one less, hampering our opponent's Planeswalkers, and giving our creatures a little boost. All for six mana. That's a pretty good deal. Tower of Fortunes. You know, again, we're generating so much mana that costing eight to draw four cards, like we don't care so much about the eight. We care more about the letters F-O-U-R right there. Four. Drawing four cards. Four is a lot of cards. A lot of cards in a format with power level similar to Vintage. I mean, there would be a lot in Limited, my goodness. But And then a couple creatures draws cards. Sandstone Oracle. You know, flying 4-4 four, four doesn't hurt. We are trying to win with damage. Um, draws us cards equal to the difference between us and whichever opponent has the most. Sometimes that's more than seven. You know, by the time you're casting this, sometimes opponents have, you know, a Reliquary Tower and a grip of like, 15 cards although you'd, you'd prefer that they didn't you know if they have that situation then odds are they're like winning the game but i digress kozilek the great distortion under 15 dollars so the, the the rare eldrazi to be under 15 the rare mythic eldrazi i should say to be under 15 dollars. i think it's because the colorless mana symbols uh i don't really know though. i don't know much about like what drives modern card prices anyway uh Draw cards equal to the difference between the number in your hand and seven. Draw up to seven. Uh, and it allows you some utility to counter some stuff. It is a pseudo control effect. But yeah, mainly it's in there because it draws us cards and it's a 12, 12 with evasion. Not, not bad because, again, we are trying to win with damage. Those are our draw effects. Control-wise, for the nth time, you know, because we're in colorless, we have to pay ridiculous amounts of mana to do normal things. Um, but we can control. Like, colorless it is not without control options, and you should still be looking to interact. Every single game of Commander you play, unless you're like an all-in combo deck, but that's not what we're doing in EDA Direct Tag now, is it? First up, alphabetically, Brittle Effigy. Uh, you play it for one. It just sits out there. Uh, but four tap, exile it, exile target creature. Um, you know, this is the sort of effect that makes Bottled Cloister a viable, you know, pseudo draw effect for us, right? Because we cast this during our main phase, but can still use it at instant speed, even though it's not an instant sitting in our hand, right? Feels a little different than most decks control suites, but it works. Um, Heart Seeker uh, is an equipment that gives a little boost to our hope, and uh, maybe more relevantly, the equipped creature can tap, unattach it to destroy a creature. And then this stays out there on the battlefield, re-equipped for five. You know, the mana cost, not as big of an issue because we're ramp, ramp, ramping super intensely. Um, yeah, great. Creature removal on a stick. Uh, very good. Hell Vault uh, for seven mana. Exile target creature we don't control. Um, the other abilities are less... I mean, I, I don't want to say less relevant because this thing can be removed and then uh, those creatures can come back. So, you know, temporary removal. If you're holding that up with seven mana, uh, it's a disincentive to attacking you because what will that attack do? So, yeah, still still definitely uh, consider that a control effect. Here we have Nivernal's Disc. Uh, you know, enters tap but destroys a bunch of things you know we will often have a bunch of things so it, it, it can alter your game plan right if you draw into this or if it's in your opening hand maybe you sit back 
before you start ramping like crazy and then put that out there and then crack it and then start ramping. You know, you, you, you want some mana rocks in hand when this is fired off so that you can um, start rebuilding your board the soonest. Uh, but always good to be the person with access to the nuke in colorless. We're going to be using some nukes because we don't have uh, that many targeted removal options. Oblivion Stone, another nuke, um, debatably better than the disc because you can save uh, permanents that are yours. I mean, you only get one fate counter per turn cycle uh, in this deck unless you have some shenanigans to untap it, but we're not dedicating those deck slots. Um, so yeah, just another nuke, basically. Wobble obble right here. Unsta you got to call it that. I came up with that. I am so proud of that. It's unstable. So it wobbles. And it's an obble because it's an obble. It's a wobble obble. It's just really good. Seven mana to destroy a permanent staple to a mana rock. Uh, even if you're not in a colorless deck. Like, th this this should be more of a staple than it is. Like, I should see this at tables more often than I do. Okay, this is an overlooked commander card. Very strong. If you have one just floating around in your collection, think about which deck would benefit the most from swapping out a mana rock for a mana rock that is also a removal spell. Universal Solvent. Again, we're paying ridiculous amounts of mana just to deal with things, but it deals with anything, right? And mana is not an issue in this deck. You know, most games are able to ramp up to seven pretty quickly. So destroying a permanent, very good. In colorless, Spine of Ish Sa. Uh, again, seven mana to destroy a permanent. This one is at sorcery speed, uh, but we get it back if it ever dies. We don't have any ways really to take advantage of that. Um, other than, I, I guess, Nevenral's Disc Oblivion Stone. Um, but uh, still, you know, being able to destroy any permanent for seven mana, that's the price we have to pay in Colorless. Predator Flagship. You know, we're worthy of note that this is also seven mana, assuming the creature does not have flying, right? Two mana to throw it up in the air and five mana to shoot it down. Interesting flavor. It's like, you have flying and now I can kill you. <laughs> uh, kind of like that. But yeah, very good. Very good removal on a stick. Perilous Fault. This is... A huge nuke exiles everything. Uh, you know, again, don't want to fire this off before we have some mana rocks in hand so that we can start building our board back uh, quicker than our opponents. But uh, yeah, always good to be the one controlling the nuke. Duplicant EDH staple here, just some creature removal staple to a creature. Uh, yeah, again, don't have a way to like get recursive value off of this, but it's good even as just a, a one of removal effect. And then finally, we have an instant. There is an instant in the deck. Scour from existence. Seven mana, exile a permanent. For whatever reason, everything is seven mana in colorless. That's just the, the, the fair price that Wizards has decided for um, removing things without color. Finally, here we have clothes and value. Clothes referring to any sort of accessory that our um, legendary Thopter might want to put. I mean, it's, it's, it always gets a little weird when you start thinking about like these swords and like sh armor shields like the pl plates of armor that you know would be form fitting for a big old golem or human or something but like what, what does it mean to put argentum armor on a thopter i'll leave that for the vorthoses in the audience uh to explain in the comment section but uh, yeah i mean <laughs> when it comes to the equipments uh that we want to run in hope uh, again, mana is not an issue very often, so uh, more so than the mana cost, what I care about is just how much of a stat boost we're getting for how many cards it is. And so plus six plus six in one equipment, pretty good. Immediately brings up um, hope to three shot range, seven power, you know, seven, 14, 21 commander damage. Uh, and the fact that it gets to destroy a permanent on attack, that's pseudo evasion, right? If you destroy a blocker um, or just deal with whatever permanent uh, is the most problematic. And, you know, six mana to cast and six more to equip. That's 12 total. Not ridiculous, not unheard of in uh, a deck like this. Running as many mana rocks as we do to do that all in one turn before our opponents can prepare for it. Bloodforged Battle Axe. Um, I like this a lot in any deck that is uh, trying to get there with equipment. Again, I mean, well, I mean, this one is cheap mana wise. One mana to cast, two to equip. Uh, but that's beside the point. Uh, there, there is no ceiling on how much of a stat boost this can ultimately give because um, you continue making copies of these battle axes. Uh, 
and each copy of the battle axe creates more copies of the battle axe. Uh, it, it gets very ridiculous very fast. Hammer of Nazan, I mean, indestructible is maybe the most important part, although uh, being able to flash equip things when they enter the battlefield is more relevant in this deck than I believe any other deck in EDH Rec Tech. Um, the 2 plus so, plus 2 plus so, doesn't matter so much, but indestructible, snap equip, very good. Um, Kusari Gama. Interesting card I found doing an advanced search. Um, two mana fire breathing, very relevant in a deck that runs this many mana rocks. Um, and yeah, whenever the creature deals damage to a blocking creature, it deals that much damage to each other creature defending player controls. I mean, it's just a huge disincentive to blocking. You're only going to want to block if you really cannot afford to take the damage that uh, Hope is, is bring into your face. Um, Loxodon Warhammer, lifelink is just such a good keyword, and plus three plus O is not irrelevant. Huge difference between a 1-1 one, one and a 4-1, and lifelink is just so, so nice. Um, Nim Deathmantle, this one is less about this one is less about the stat boost and more about Hope's ability to turn off um, non-creature spells from opponents that have been dealt damage uh, by it that turn um, because you can pay four to just immediately bring back hope even if um, her mana cost has exceeded four right from the command zone if she's been cast a few times um, so like this because it's a way to get some value off of the uh, other ability that hope has planar bridge mana again not an issue very often um, if we have this and lots of mana rocks this could be a great way to search up some sort of permanent that draws us cards or some sort of big scary equipment i mean i don't know there there are lots of possibilities um, as to what this can get planar portal in lieu of i don't know black mana this can help us tutor for things on sticks. Instead of black mana, what we have is a lot of mana. <laughs> uh, and yeah, just good little toolboxy effect gets us whatever we might need. Maybe it'll get us uh, an oblivion stone, right? Uh, Tatsumasa the Dragon's Fang. Uh, again, we don't care so much about the mana cost. We care more about the stat boost for the number of cards that it is. The, the most relevant thing here is just that it gives plus five, plus five. I guess, you know, at some point maybe we would remove this sword from the game to put a dragon into play. Um, and yeah, if that dragon dies, this comes back a little bit weird. There might be some sort of uh, technical line of play with that at some point that I'm not thinking of right now. But uh, yeah, I think it definitely makes some use out of a dragon. Uh, sword of Cauldra, again, care mostly about the plus five, plus five. Um, you know, a strong incentive, strong disincentive, I should say, to blocking. Although, I mean, I don't know. If you're trying to block a 6-6 six, six flyer anyway, you, you probably just want to throw a dork uh, in front of it. So mainly about the plus 5, plus 5 here. And uh, finally, Sigil of Distinction. I love this in any deck that's trying to win with equipment because X can be just huge. I think this was in my um, Joyra build. This The Joyra deck, not totally different from this Hope of Gear per deck in a lot of ways. There are definitely some things that they are doing in parallel with each other, namely playing lots of mana rocks, but uh, putting this on a Hope, uh, I mean, I don't know, at a certain point in the game, X could be 20. I mean, goodness, like you could you could one-shot with the Hope of Gear per. Wouldn't that feel great? 21 commander damage to the dome from a 1-1 Thopter. Possible because of Sigil of Distinction. Let's look at the early to mid-game turns of a Hope of Gear per build that I just walked you through. We have three non-basic lands in hand. We have a Mind Stone. We have an equipment that we can use to make our Hope a little spooky. We have some card draw in the form of Mind's Eye. And the equipment also is pseudo-removal. So we, we have everything we need. We have three lands, two ramp effects, a big card draw effect, and then like a re repeatable removal that also serves as a way to give our... Uh, commander a little bit more in the, in the form of teeth. So uh, turn one, Throne of the High City. Uh, kind of picked one at random there. And then we will, as usual, cast Hope of Gear Per. Oh, we also draw a card for turn one duplicate. Cool, doesn't affect our turn one play. Turn two, untap, draw a Strip Mine. Hey, that's a pretty decent card. Uh, let's go ahead and play it. Strip Mine, just spook our opponents a little bit, right? Uh, for two mana, we'll drop a Mind Stone. And uh, we will get someone down to uh, 20 commander damage left, right? 20 before they're killed by our Hope of Gear Per. Every bit counts, you know? You, know, you, you never know when you might have exact Caesar. You might be short by one. Don't miss the opportunity to get a little poke in. And to turn, 
untap this turn three. We will be drawing a mystifying maze. I'm not hurting for lands here, let's think. Yeah, let's go ahead and play the mystifying maze. We uh, have plenty of ways to destroy lands already in the form of strip mine. That leaves us with four mana, which we could use to cast a heart seeker, um, or we could just drop a seer's lantern. I like the seer's lantern play a little bit better. One, two, three, um, just because when you can ramp, you might as well ramp. Uh, and then beyond that, that, that's about all we're looking to do, although it is still very early, turn three. So turn four, untap, draw, uh, Vessel of Endless Rest. Go ahead and play a Dust Bowl. Um, we have six mana available. Uh, if we pay three for the Vessel, then that'll drop us down to four mana available, which is not enough to Mind's Eye. Um, I think Mind's Eye is probably the play here. We do one, two, three, four, five. Get that Mind's Eye into play. It will immediately replace itself when our opponent draws for their draw step. The Hammer of Nazan, not a bad thing to see. We'll uh, take turn five. Untap, draw, Mannequin. Love that card. Ghost Quarter, I mean, just, I mean look, look at that little mannequin. He's got like a little diamond or something. What's that all about? Very, it's like, that is what a colorless mana, I guess, looks like <laughs> in the real world. It's a diamond. Interesting. I always thought a diamond would be like a white mana of some sort. I don't know why. I don't know why. Anyway, uh, we have uh, seven mana available to us, which is not enough to cast and equip the Heart Seeker. Um, the Vessel of Endless Rest is appealing to me. The Hammer of Nazan. Oh, yeah, the Hammer of Nazan does appeal to me because then we could immediately drop a Heat or a Heart Seeker and uh, not have to pay its equip cost next turn. Yeah, 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 yeah. Something's coming together. Let's say. For one, two, three, four. We'll drop a hammer of Nazan. Drop the hammer. Attach it to our hope, because that's what it does as soon as it enters. And, uh, I guess it still needs an equip cost printed on it in case it gets unattached. Right, so I was wondering for a second why they even printed one on there. Uh, but yeah, that makes hope of gear per a 3 1. It'll be swinging in, dealing three damage. Why not? And then uh, we have three mana up, second main phase. We could do, I think we should do a Vessel of Endless Rest. We will end our turn. We'll pay one to draw one more card off of our Mind Stone. Go to turn six. Untap. Draw. Main phase. Yeah, let's play as Scavenger Grounds, I guess. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously contingent on what's going on with the rest of the board, uh, but we can interact with our lands should we need to. I haven't really been paying a ton of attention. If there's a big threatening creature, maybe we hold up for this mystifying maze. Um, but maybe instead what we can do is for one, two, three, four, drop a heart seeker. It will immediately attach itself to the hope of gear per, making it a five, two. Right, five, two, there it is. Five, two, what it do? Start combat, swing in with the hope. There is hope. We can change. Uh, Heart Seeker. We can tap unattached Heart Seeker, destroy target creature. So yeah, if there is a threatening creature, maybe we don't swing with the hope. Maybe we're tapping it instead to unattach the Heart Seeker. But I digress. Um, second main phase. Yeah, it probably makes sense to pay two mana and drop the mannequin. And then over the course of our opponent's turns, uh, tap one, two, three to draw. One, two, three cards. And the turn there, go to seven, untap, draw one more, main phase. Yeah, sure, blink moth well, you know, yeah, all sorts of utility that I'm not even spending a lot of time thinking about because it could be so darn situational. But we have six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven mana available to us on turn seven. Uh, not quite enough to cast and activate the planar portal that is in our hand. We could drop a duplicate to deal with a problem creature. We could continue ramping with the Guardian Idol. We could unattach the Heart Seeker to destroy a creature. Yeah, we, we have a lot of play here. We could just sit back and draw cards on the Mind's Eye and, uh, you know, act like we're holding up responses at the very least. Yeah, a lot, lot of ways that the game could go from here. I'm going to pump the brakes on gold fishing right there. But uh, you get an idea of how quickly Hope of Gearper can get to a uh, pretty interesting 
out of board position. That's EDH Rec Tech for this week. I'll see you again, same time, same place next week. Subscribe to Pogo Bat Gaming so that you never miss quality content such as this. Uh, call your mom if you haven't recently, and um, uh, uh, check out all the links in the description. Uh, and, and, and remember, the, the, the real win condition is having the most fun, and the real game is the meta game and your place in it, right? You wanna, you wanna be kind to others in your EDH pods. That matters far more than winning. Although everyone should be trying to win, like that's part of the social contract of playing a game of magic, right? And part of what makes it fun for everyone is that they might not win because other people are trying to, and they're smart people that you enjoy hanging out with and playing games with. But uh, where were we? Oh yeah, I'm done. I'm done with EDH Rec Tech for this week. So that's goodbye for now, but we'll be hanging out a lot more after this. I, I, I guarantee it. You're going to like the way you look.